This evening on The Rock Newman Show, with reparations, gentrification, issues like the Mueller report and rising calls for President Trump's impeachment making headlines, we'll share an illuminating discussion on the politics of the unusual with political scientist Dr. Ron Daniels, president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century. That's coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to The Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University right here in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. This evening as the call for reparations for years of racism, economic and social inequity rise in the presidential debate and the dark side of gentrification makes itself known in black communities nationally, we'll explore these issues and the prospects for Donald Trump's future following the release of the Mueller report. Joining me for the hour to explore and analyze these issues is Dr. Ron Daniels, a seasoned political scientist, president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century, former executive director of the National Rainbow Coalition, and deputy campaign manager for Reverend Jesse Jackson's presidential run in 1988. Dr. Daniels, welcome. We have been trying to do this for six years. That's right, brother. We've been trying to get it on. Well, here we are. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, man, it's my privilege. All right. Um, as an esteemed political scientist, <clears throat> a veteran professor, I'd like to start this show off with asking you to define white supremacy and talk a minute before we get into all else we're doing, about the far-reaching, long-time and current effects of white supremacy. Well, white supremacy is very simple. It is the idea, and it was concocted, that somehow uh, people who were supposed to be Caucasoids or the Caucasian um, was superior, uh, innately superior. And of course, there was the famous, you know, the lingo in the black community, if you're light, you're all white. You're all right, brown stick around, yellow mellow, but black get back. Black get back. Because in that schematic, yeah. you know, white is always right, mm -hmm. and then at the bottom mm -hmm. is black. And then the notion was that in the evolution of humankind, which is of course totally mythology, mm -hmm. that the European, you know, from the Caucasoid mountains and so forth and so on, was a superior person. And then just beneath that were the, the, the so-called so Asiatic people and then the mongoloid or the mongoloids, and then there were the negroids, mm -hmm. and the negroids were at the bottom. Yeah. And so this mythology, you know, has, has permeated virtually every aspect of life in Europe, and certainly in these United States of America. And what it has led to is systems of white domination, but not only white domination of white privilege, because there's a sense in which people who are white, in some instances not even consciously, believe that white people are superior. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's innate, sometimes they function in a way without even realizing it so. But the impacts are devastating because one British historian, Arnold Toynbee, once said, he said, all of all the races of humankind, only the African has contributed nothing to humankind. <laughs> and, and so when you, when you look at that, uh, you're, looking at, you're looking at the devastating consequences of it. And then, because people act on that, mm -hmm. right? Now, let me just say this. <clears throat> in terms of one of the greatest holocausts in human history, the Holocaust of Enslavement, that actually wasn't predicated initially on the notion of black, black inferiority mm -hmm. because in reality, there were people who knew better mm -hmm. because they knew about the great Sudanic kingdoms. They right. knew about the universities that had been flourishing in that. Mm -hmm. They needed cheap labor. 
But then there came a ration later, the rationale mm -hmm. that it was legitimate because mm -hmm. these were inferior uh, human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the whole notion of, of, of Christian, the advancement of Christianity, right. blessed by the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, and but, but the bottom line is the devastating consequences on the psychocultural um, sort of sense of black people, mm -hmm. which we've been fighting about, you know, against for, for now centuries. Yeah. Uh, and, and today it manifests itself in lots of different ways in terms of institutional racism. Mm -hmm. And institutional racism is not about whether I like you or don't like you. It's like the old saying, sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but names will never hurt me. Yeah. I could care less whether white people say, I don't like you. Mm -hmm. The real deal is that when you can translate your sense of superiority into policy mm -hmm. and practices yeah. that actually exclude me and extrain, constrain me from, from uh, fulfilling my aspirations. Mm -hmm. And that's what institutional racism is. And about. so white supremacy's reaction to what was uh, reconstruction uh, what was uh, 1954 decision uh, that Thurgood Marshall, graduated from Howard University Law right, School, right, right, helped right. effectuate. Um, and now white supremacist reaction to eight years of a black family living in the White House. Yeah. <laughs> white supremacy, right. it is argued, contributed greatly to the election of Donald Trump. Well, I don't think there's any question about that. And I also think that it's not just Donald Trump. Donald mm -hmm. Trump is the, the latest manifestation of a malignancy that's been brewing. Because remember the Tea Party. Absolutely. You, you remember, see, and this is the other, one of the brilliant things about Reverend Jesse Jackson. He says, it's not only the people who are in the white, the white robes. Yeah. He says, it's those that's in, in the black suits. Mm -hmm and the blue suits and the black robes. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a way in which if you look at Nixon, there was a Southern strategy. Yeah. If you look at Ronald Reagan, he deliberately went to the South to signal to, he didn't have to say it, mm -hmm. I'm with you, yeah. right? Yeah. And so- Started Trump, his campaign, uh, uh, Ronald right. Reagan started his campaign in, 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 in Mississippi. Right, so, so Trump, not, and, really, and, and near where Swanna Goodman and Cheney That's had right. been killed. That's so right. he could have gone there. Sure. Sure. That would have sent a different signal. Sure. He didn't go there. Yeah. He didn't even touch that mm -hmm. because he was trying to signal mm -hmm. to white folks, I'm mm -hmm. on your side, mm -hmm. without having to say it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of insidious, subtle, beneath racism that needs to also be exposed. Let me just quickly say something about Reconstruction, however, because when you look at how racism is used as a, a strategy to, to, to divide and exploit, because mm -hmm. one of the great tragedies of American history is those people who are at the bottom largely white working class people should really be working with black people, yeah. right? But here's what happened, quickly. Mm -hmm. See, people don't really look closely at what happened right after Reconstruction. Immediately after Reconstruction, there were a group of people called the Redeemers who really were not opposed to black people continuing to have rights. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you read the literature, see Bram Woodbury's, he, they talk about, they even talk about white trash, mm -hmm. you know, and, sure. and, and this kind of stuff. Sure. But there came a movement called the populist movement that needs to be studied much more carefully. Mm -hmm. In the populist movement, black farmers and black workers, and one of the things that also is not remembered and known is, other than Marcus Garvey, the largest mass movement in this country were black farmer associations in the South. Right. You had white folks who were rebelling against other white people correctly because they were being exploited by the new class of rulers in the South. Mm -hmm. So black folks and white folks came together, a guy named Tom Watson, mm -hmm. and, and, and they for a moment formed the top populist movement and they almost overturned the white power structure in the South. The decision was, mm-hmm, we ain't never letting this happen again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in order to prevent that from happening, mm -hmm. of course, Watson weakened. Yeah. He, they came to him and said, well, yeah. Rock, we, we all white people. Why, why would, why would mm -hmm. you mess with them, them darkies and jungle mm -hmm. bunnies? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so they bought that. Yeah. But they reinforced it by saying, we will set up a system where you will always benefit from your whiteness yeah. in two ways, mm -hmm. psychologically, mm -hmm. And material yeah. and the psychological. Oh, you are hitting. You are hitting yeah. so fundamentally. Yeah, well, so the psychological benefit was, you'll have your own toilets. 
your own yeah. water fountains. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you get buried in the cemetery, what do you really want that, that for that, so the leash over to your grave? Mm -hmm. They say, okay, we got that. But they say, we're gonna do something else. Mm -hmm. If there, are, there will be certain jobs that will be set aside just for white people. Yeah. You see, when you start talking about affirmative action, yeah. people need to understand that. This was an affirmative <laughs> action program for white people yes. over long periods of time. Yes. And they said, if by chance we get in a bind, if we just have to hire some black people, mm -hmm. we will always pay you more than them. Mm -hmm. So that was what Jim Crow was really all about. Mm -hmm. And so historically, that same pattern and system has been used over and over again to divide people who really should be allied with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just wanted to throw yeah. that little combat yeah. in there because that still gets played out today, mm -hmm. really. I mean, the mm -hmm. same people who were in the Tea Party angry at black folks should have really been angry at the people on Wall Street. They're the ones who are exploiting them. Right. But we end up being the ones that are conveniently the targets mm -hmm. and we're quite visible, of course, you can't miss us. Mm -hmm. You know what, you mentioned, you, 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 you mentioned a couple of different times when I asked you about white supremacy, about the mythology that is promulgated. And so those who practice or try to uphold the white power structure just like you said, uh, the gentleman said, um, the Africa never contributed any, anything to society. So those who would challenge you that that's not, that's not mythology, that it is real, I would just like you to respond, and obviously this is gonna take you to antiquity probably. <laughs> Ain't no question about it. But I would like you to, for you to respond and answer that challenge that it's not mythology. Well, that's, real. Well, that's one of, say, well, that's one of the great gifts of having Dr. John Henry Clark among us. That's one of the great gifts uh, uh, of having Ben Yakuman, yeah. you know, among Dr. us. Dr. Ben. Yeah, Dr. Ben among yeah. us. Because they, they challenge frontally this mythology. And in reality, it, it is from, first of all, the archaeology and the anthropology is now clear. Mm -hmm. All human life began in Mother Africa. You can trace all of humankind back to Africa and, and you know, a single African woman indeed. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we're all Africans, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And of course, over the time as, as evolutionary trends, people morphed in, into different races and so forth and so on. But birth, the birth of civ human civilization, was with, not only are we the source of human civilization, of humankind, but then the manifestation of all the early civilizing influences came out of particularly Kemet. And even in the Bible, they talk about it. Mm -hmm. The Nubians, mm -hmm. you know, the Nubians. Who are the Nubians? The Nubians are the people from the south. Yeah. You know, or they're called the Kushites. Mm -hmm. Same people. Mm -hmm. Right. The first people to actually uh, deal with iron at the Iron Age, right? Mm -hmm. And then up the Nile Valley mm -hmm. to Egypt, yeah. and the Egyptians were black people. Yeah. Now later on, there was some mingling, so forth yeah. and so on. But yeah. when you see the images, mm -hmm. you see the images of black people. Mm -hmm. So when you start talking about great civilizations, that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. If, if and, I could interject. Let, let me, let me just, I just okay. got to do it. I got to oh, throw this oh, in there. Okay. Because, you know, we taught that Hippocrates is supposed to be the father of medicine. Mm -hmm. You get thrown in there. 2,000 years before Hippocrates, there was Emotep. And Emotep was the first, per he was a multi-genius. He was the first one to deal with building, uh, building pyramids, building structures in stone alone. Mm -hmm. Today, they still can't figure out how that happened. Mm -hmm. But he was also a mathematician. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was also uh, a medicine person. He was conducting mm -hmm. surgery mm -hmm. 2,000 years at least before there was a Hippocrates. Mm -hmm. That's the real father mm -hmm. of medicine. Yeah. And of course, you answered precisely what I was going to speak to because you said we're up into Egypt. And I was gonna say in the event that my viewing audience have ne has never heard of Imhotep, that is a name that in every, you know one thing, not just black households, but if you're talking about being real, of that course. all households should understand, recognize and study the name M Hotel. Oh, absolutely. And as you just said, you mentioned Hippocrates, and that's a, obviously that's very much a connection because Hippocrates himself said, M Hotep is my father. Right. Well, not only that, you know, when you go back and look at it, you know, all of you know the, the when when the Greeks, Greek civilization is based on African civilization. Yeah. When you read Herodotus, Herodotus mm -hmm. talks about these mm -hmm. these these great noble people. Mm -hmm. You know, and by the way, in the ancient world, uh, 
superiority and inferiority was not determined by on, on the basis of race. That's mm -hmm. a modern phenomenon. Sure. It was sure. on the basis of culture. Mm -hmm. Those people who were considered culture, irrespective of their race, mm -hmm. were so there were several Roman emperors who were black yeah. because they embraced being Roman. Mm -hmm. They didn't care what your color was. Mm -hmm. And of course, the early, the early Christian church. I mean, you are shredding this mythology now. Come on. Well, I, <laughs> that's what we hear, brother. <laughs> that's it. that's why we hear. Um, but, but let me just quickly say this sure. as well, though. So here's the problem. The problem is that the white power structure may buy this mythology, but it really doesn't care about it. Mm -hmm. It only uses it when it's in their best interest, mm -hmm. right? So in the First World War, when Johnny went marching off to war mm -hmm. and we've been being locked in the South, and that's a whole nother discussion, mm -hmm. we've been locked in the South. Mm -hmm. Something like 13, 14, 15, 16 million Europeans came in and took jobs in the factories, the foundries, and all that. Mm -hmm. We were being what? Sharecroppers, uh, 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 wage ag agricultural labor, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, none of that was good yeah. in terms of how people were treated. Right. But if you had a choice between a wage being a wage earner and a factory or a foundry and a mill, mm -hmm. you would take that over being a sharecropper. Mm -hmm. But we were locked in the South. Mm -hmm. The point I'm making also is there are a lot of people who came and benefited from that intergenerationally who have no clue mm -hmm. that their ability to have lived in this society is an intergenerational benefit from that. Mm -hmm. But when Johnny went marching off to war, they took all that mythology aside. What did they do? Yeah. They started sending by the train loads mm -hmm. to bring us up to yeah. Detroit and various other places in order to work in those places. Mm -hmm. But when they started, when the white workers started to organize, then they used us against the white workers. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up battling each other when the real enemy was them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so you see that being played out time and time and time again. So what we, what we would hope at some point yeah is there's a, a sufficient number of white people who, if they knew better, would do better. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the difficulty is that because you have white privilege, you don't sometimes sacrifice that even if you sure, know better, because sure. it's in your economic benefit to be white. Mm -hmm. And the struggle continues. Yeah, Luther continues. continue. In, in that regard. I want to talk, um, you're a political scientist, so I want to talk about uh, politics. Um, we have uh, a couple of uh, videos from your history, <laughs> and uh, we're going to show them uh, in a moment. But before e we even do that, <clears throat> it seems to me that this is a unique time. Uh, there was a recent uh, uh, a town hall where candidates attempted to address black women, specifically black women, mm -hmm. and it uh, and it seems to me that that was done for only one reason, because there is a recognition of how powerful the black woman voting block is in this country now. It can determine your success or failure. No question. As an organizer, as a political scientist, I'd like for you to give me your thoughts on that power and your vision on how that power might best be utilized in these upcoming years and certainly leading into the 2020 election? Well, that's almost, that's a no-brainer. Um, first and foremost, um, let's just deal with the black vote in general. Mm -hmm. One of the things that people don't look at enough is that the biggest political party in America today is not the Democrats, it's not the Republicans, it's non-voters. Most white people don't vote. Mm -hmm. And so in a low participation environment, the group that actually organizes itself and registers has power disproportionate to its numbers. Mm -hmm. So I've always had this formula, if we can get 90% of black people registered to vote and 90% of them turn out on election day, yeah. we would like, we, we, we would be dominant, really, yeah. because most white people don't vote, because yeah. they're alienated whole bunches of things. Mm -hmm. Now within the context of that, what we have found in the most recent period is a surge. And some of that is, I think, attributable to Michelle Obama, who had a very positive influence, but there are other influences too, mm -hmm. particularly in the sense that black women, even though they are for women's equality and black feminism and so forth, there's been a distinction because 
they have never seen that as being antagonistic necessarily to black men. Mm -hmm. They want equality, but they want to preserve the nature of who we are as a people. Mm -hmm. And so black women have been taking up the notion of advancing an agenda. So the women's march, when the women's march went down, black women stepped forward and said, well, wait a minute, y'all not gonna lead this. Yeah. Because it's like, it's like Sojourner Truth said, Ain't I a woman? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? She called. So they were, because historically there's been also this, this way in which white women have also benefited, sometimes it even to the detriment of black women. Mm -hmm. So they came forward and said, we must be a part of this movement. Not only must we be a part of this movement, we must be central to this movement. Mm -hmm. And so as the Trumpian phenomenon, the orange man's phenomena emerged, then they became a key driving force in the 2018 election helping to push the Democrats across the border, right? Mm -hmm. Across the finish line. Mm -hmm. So for me, what that means is, it ain't gonna be popular. Now let me just say, strategically, we need to defeat Trump, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't hear nothing about white men. Mm -hmm. Old white men or young white men. Mm -hmm. I don't care how bright they are, how smart they are, this is the age of the woman and it is the age of black women. And so what I wanna see, frankly, is a ticket that has women and people of color involved in it. Mm -hmm. Now, if it, all that fails, fine. But this whole notion that this being played out, and I'll use Biden as an example, who should sit down. Mm -hmm. I like Joe Biden, he's a mm -hmm. nice guy, mm -hmm. but his role should have been to go get those white working class voters. Mm -hmm. He just did a thing in Pennsylvania, they're talking about, well, it'll be one here. What I'd like to do, Rock, is go to Pennsylvania and look at how many unregistered black voters there are. Mm -hmm. Now, if you went to that black voter, mm -hmm. you would offset what was going on with these alienated and angry, and, and, and I'm not saying that they don't have a legitimate grievance in some way. I'm, I give them a break to some degree. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, and Jesse Jackson proved that, by the way, not all of them are racist, so forth. they're in pain, right? right? Mm -hmm. But I don't see, why do we sacrifice over and over again the most loyal block in the Democratic Party has been what? We have been the most loyal ones. Mm -hmm. And we're never, we're never rewarded in proportion to our support or our needs. Mm -hmm. So my position is clear. We need to be focusing on women. Women are the lead this ticket. And so I'd like to see if Kamala could come through, fine. If it's, if it's Elizabeth Warren, fine. Maybe it's Kamala. I, that's what I'm looking for mm -hmm. in terms of a ticket in this election. And so you said you'd like to see Joe Biden go sit down. That's a statement. But not only that, I want to see Bernie sit down too. And uh -huh. I like Bernie. Uh -huh. I think Bernie made a contribution. Because mm -hmm. what Bernie did was he drove, and I've been trying to tell people this forever. People keep talking about the, the middle. The middle is not some platonic, static thing. Yeah. You drive the middle to the right. You mm -hmm. can drive it to the left. Mm -hmm. And then that which was once the, 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 the extreme becomes acceptable. Mm -hmm. Well, Medicare for all, a whole bunch of ideas mm -hmm. have come out that Bernie Sanders helped to contribute. That was his contribution, mm -hmm. and he did it brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And he did it as a democratic socialist, and quite frankly, some of these young millennial women and men, they ain't scared. Mm -hmm. They don't care nothing about no social. They didn't mm -hmm. live up through the Red Scare, McCarthy's and all that. All mm -hmm. they want is a better life for themselves, mm -hmm. right? So now my position is Bernie Sanders should go bring his base to the table. Mm -hmm. Biden brings his base to the table. Mm -hmm. We bring our base to the table. Mm -hmm. Because what Florida demonstrated and Georgia demonstrated, what, what was that all about, right? The majority, still the majority of, of people in Florida are still white people. The majority of people in, in Georgia are still white people. What Stacey Abrams was able to do was galvanize black voters as a part of a coalition. Mm -hmm. But that coalition was strongly based in the black community mm -hmm. with white progressives and Latinos and Asians. It was a rainbow coalition mm -hmm. rooted in the black community. Mm -hmm. Gillum did the same thing in Florida, mm -hmm. right? So that same thing can happen in this forthcoming election. Mm -hmm. And that's why we must have issues, however, that are definable, that do not assume the trickle down, and there are some good things. If you mm -hmm. got healthcare, that, we wanna know what are the issues that are affecting black people? Mm -hmm. And can you publicly articulate that so that I will be energized mm -hmm. to go to the poll, to the, to the voting booth? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. You are speaking um, about how to make the, how to use the two-party system for, to the, to the greater end. What do you say to those that are more radical that says this system, this political system 
there needs to be a full resolution and this system needs to be disbanded. Oh, I agree with that. Uh -huh. But having said that, so what? Yeah. You know, therefore, what do you do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, you and I both, we're, I consider myself a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. I don't go around every day talking about it because, right. you know, I don't think it's necessary to do that. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple of things. The Rainbow Coalition, as Reverend Jesse Jackson pulled together, had the potential for being the most radical political organization since that populist movement I talked about. Mm -hmm because it was not going to be aligned exclusively with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. It was going to take up the principle of no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, mm -hmm. a permanent interest, mm -hmm. as reflected in what we did in Gary in 1972 when we started to develop what? Black political agendas, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the key. So what we ought to be doing, number one, is black people leading this charge, is even if we're in the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. there's a brother out of uh, New York. His name is Charles Barron radical revolutionary brother come mm -hmm. out of the black Would you, Charles Barron Charles Barron assemblyman uh -huh. Charles mm -hmm. Barron mm -hmm. and his wife Ines Barron mm -hmm. they he comes out of the Black Panther Party yeah he's aligned with the Democratic Party only as a vehicle mm -hmm. because he understands that that's still a part of the popular consciousness of where black people are mm -hmm. and so he uses that as a way to advance a radical agenda mm -hmm. but that radical agenda is based on the ability to actually concrete del concretely deliver things to people as well mm -hmm. Gabral, well, I won't go on you, you know who Gabral. Yeah. Gabral says the people do not struggle for ideas alone. They struggle for a change in their material condition. So mm -hmm. you have to be able to deliver that way. Mm -hmm. So a third force is necessary. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is this. The Democratic Party uh, is not, the Democratic Party is not a transformational party. Mm -hmm. right? it, it is not going to change the system. So what I point out is, that there are incremental things that the Democratic Party do when we push it that does make a difference in the, in the lives of average ordinary people. Mm -hmm. That makes the playing field different. Mm -hmm. So, so I say it's 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 not it's not it's not a, it, the differences between the Democratic and Republican Party is not fundamental. It's incremental, but it's not inconsequential. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things I really want to push hard. And let me stop. You. Okay. Let me stop you right there because we have a video of you speaking on black politics. Okay. <laughs> and it's a good place to take a look at that particular video. Let's do that just right now and take a look. One of the things that we learned from Gary, we need to relearn again is, it's not a, just about personalities. It's about political process. Dr. Ronald Walters, my dear beloved friend, now deceased, he talked about that all of his life. If you're running for office, we ought to have a set of indicators. You don't vote for somebody because they make the best speech or because they, you know, they look good or wear the best suit or whatever, because you sure couldn't do that for Charles Barron if he ain't wearing the best suit because he's wearing a different kind of suit. You go off, but then he ain't got no tie, so you ain't going with that. <laughs> Question is, what is the agenda? And sometimes you got five or six people running for something. We need to be able to sit down and say, well, wait a minute, you can't all win. We need a committee to decide which is the best candidate who can win. Process. The Shirley Chisholm Presidential Accountability Commission, we're not against Obama, we're not against any president necessarily, but that job is to see what are you doing for black people? What is your position as it relates to black issues? You know, again. I don't know about that. Who is that guy? That guy. <laughs> um, as a, uh, again, I, I keep honing in, you are a political scientist. And that just reminded me of an election, the mayoral election in St. Louis a couple of years ago, uh, if it's been that long, where there were multiple blacks in the race That's right. and a white, la a That's white lady. Right. Happened all over the country. And the, 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 the black politicians could not get out of their own way That's right. to give one, of, one the best chance to win. It was very clear that that many people in the race would dilute the vote and give someone who they all were against an opportunity to win. Right. So, and you say to those what? Process. Just what I just said there. And that's why, that's why a third force would focus on that, by the way. We need that instrument out here. We need to remind, because what happens is, unfortunately, some black elected officials, in fact, maybe too many black elected officials have dis have, are divorced from the mission that we saw earlier. Mm -hmm. Early on, we said, you know, coming out of the black power movement, 
what's electoral politics about? Electoral politics is about straining the system. We know the system is not for all of it, but let's strain that system. Mm -hmm. Let's get the maximum out of it, right? Mm -hmm. And we as elected officials ought to be always organizing our people in order to build accountability structures mm -hmm. in the community, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so many of the early politicians, were that's what they were about. It was about a mission. Mm -hmm. right? But then after a while, it changed into, I'm the only Negro to ever been elected this position. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad mm -hmm. to be in America where I have the, and then it became, unfortunately, even worse than that because then people began to, 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 to be complicit in figuring out how to use resources for their own mm -hmm. self-aggrandizement. One of the reasons I wanted you here is because we've looked at your work to try to change that kind of mindset, to structurally and in an organized way, to try to advance the betterment of a people that have been long uh, oppressed. To that end, and following up on what you just said, we have another video. It's you on training new leadership. Let's take a look at that. We need to train new leadership. Old tactics, new tactics, whatever they are, in order to be able to challenge successfully this monster that we're facing out here. Therefore, we're emerging the Domu Smith Leadership Development Organizer Training Institute. Research consortium. We want scholars associated with us, but not just scholars. All these talking heads we see on the TV screen. Oh, but they pontificating about this, pontificating about that. And I guess it ain't too bad. But what I'm interested in is applied research. Go to the hood, work with the people, and then develop some theory out of that. Or you make your research available to the people. Otherwise, it's just research. Research in, serves in, 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 in search of a check somewhere. And you know, I ain't hating on you because you want to make some money. But at the end of the day, use your skills for the development of black people. Got to be of the race and for the race. Let me say of that. the race and for you the race. Be of the race and for the race. And when you. That's you, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm saying that. I mean, you were a successful boxing promoter. I mean, you did a whole lot of stuff, right? I mean, so you could go off and just. Why, why would you do this? Because you're of the race and for the race. Now, you black. We, I'm, we both black. But there are a whole lot of black people out there who are authentically black, who, who are cosmetically black, but are not authentically black mm -hmm. in the sense that they preserve a sense that no matter where I go, I know from whence I've come. I know what my roots are, and I will never leave my people behind. So I'm of the race, and wherever I go, I may be in corporate America, and the taxes may be even different. Mm -hmm. I may not be out there picketing. Mm -hmm. I may not be out there running for office, but I can write a check, mm -hmm. or I can be in a position of slipping you some information when I know something ain't going right, so you know on the outside what to do. We have to have people who are of the race and for the race, and that's a part of the kind of training and servant leaderships. It's not about Ron Daniels. It's mm -hmm. not about Rock Newman. Mm -hmm. We don't do this because it's for our own personal, you know, glorification and so forth. We do this because of the collective possibilities of our people to regain our mm -hmm. sense in history, mm -hmm. to rebuild our communities. Mm -hmm. And not only to rebuild them, because everybody know if we ever get up on our feet in a positive sense, mm -hmm. we will lead ourselves and lead the world because that's in our DNA. That's who we are. That's the emotep in us. When you wear your African garb, what message are you looking for that to send? Well, I wear that because I want people to know from whence we've come and I want them to identify accordingly. Uh, but I want to go a step beyond that to deal with the substance and essence of what it means to be an African in the 20th and 20, in the 21st century. And that's why, by the way, Kwanzaa is so important. Because mm -hmm. what Dr. Mylana Karinga did was to take the, because at the end of the day, we have to root ourselves in our historical values because they've been successful. We've shown what we could do the great Sudanic kingdoms and all the work that we, all the, the great inventors, all this stuff that we have done shows that we, we, we are great people when we're in our right minds, when we stay within the framework of our African centeredness. Now that doesn't mean that you don't use other ideas, but you use those ideas in, res, in relationship to your foundation. The Chinese decided to wall themselves off. They built a great wall and they're so walling themselves off they became isolated from the world. The Japanese took a different position. They kept their Japanese culture intact, 
but they borrowed a little here, a little there, and they grafted it to what? Their fundamental Japanese historical worldview. So my whole thing is that that's what we have to continue to do. We have to be about doing that, that grafting. We have to maintain a sense of our African-centeredness. And so when we look at Kwanzaa, that's a way of constantly like repeating that. And so the other thing is, you know, I mean, I'm always going to have something. Today, it's, this, my fez is a way of also uh, identifying. I could have maybe wore some kente and whatever, mm -hmm. but I'm always got something, mm -hmm. you know, and I mm -hmm. watch what happens. So I have an a African, um, just, an, just a little African little, little pendant that I wear. Right. But what happens is people look at that mm -hmm. and people ask me about it. Mm -hmm. And then I give them a card. I mm -hmm. say, look, go, go to the website of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century. Mm -hmm. So I'm always trying to send that message. But I also want to send the message is, that there may be some people who never ever put on anything African, mm -hmm. but their minds may still be rooted in Africa. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to dismiss people simply on the cosmetic because beyond the cosmetic must be the substance of understanding what blackness is really all about. And that blackness is, is about some principles, it's about some values. And these values, if we are able to restore them and embed them in our community, it's about really, really maintaining community, which is we, us, and our, not me, myself, and I. Mm -hmm. And it's about that ability, again, to really have a global presence in which. That makes me want to do this. The Institute of Black World 21st Century. Your, your, you, you write in your mission, the Institute of Black World 21st Century is committed to enhancing the capacity of black communities in the U.S. and globally to achieve cultural, social, economic, and political equality and an enhanced quality of life for all marginalized people. It would seem to me that if you put the, de put the word Pan-Africanism oh, beside that, that is the definition. There's no question about it. We are Pan-Africanists. I am a Pan-Africanist, no question. I'm a nationalist and a Pan-Africanist. And when I say a nationalist, let me just say this too. It's important to distinguish things. We have some people, Cornell West is among them. I love Cornell West, but Cornell West is always talking bad about nationalists. Oh, you can't be a nationalist. I don't know where that comes from. Well, nationalism can be bad if it's chauvinistic and if it's narrow and if it's also presumption, it also presumes a sense of superiority. Mm -hmm. That's not the kind of nationalist I am and there are some who are like that. Nationalism, we are progressive nationalists. What does that mean? We struggle against race, classism, um, uh, uh, gender, we fight for gender equality, so we're against chauvinism. We're against all those things that afflict the human spirit. And by the way, where does that come from? I do that because when I go back to the ancient concept, comedic concept of mayat, mayat says that we must be for justice, right? And that's translated in the Bible too for people who really want to do liberation theology. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying I can literally trace that definition back to my worldview that says, I am for myself, mm -hmm. but I'm also about the business of helping all oppressed business. I say charity, I say the whole thing. Charity begins at home and spreads abroad. Mm -hmm. Love thy neighbor as thyself. But you can't, you should not be loving your neighbor and hating yourself. Mm -hmm. See, that's, when, that's the bind that we have been in. Mm -hmm. We must first come to grips with who we are. Yeah. And then that magnanimity can be spread to all oppressed people because when you do that, and it's not about being arrogant about it either. Mm -hmm. It is that example. Mm -hmm. That's the power. It's your sense of righteousness and justice. That's what has black people, people like run after black people. They run after our music. They mm -hmm. run after our examples. Mm -hmm. Some bad examples too, mm -hmm. because there's something about black people that just mystifies folks. And when we see that in a positive sense, we lead with our character. We lead with our values. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing with the Institute of the Black World 21st Century. Among other things, what we try to do more than anything else, is to try to convince black people anew that that whole proverb, what is it the, in, 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 in Ezekiel 36 about the, the, the dry bones? Mm -hmm. Well, we're disconnected people. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the neck bone, yeah. the, the foot, the ankle yeah. bone. Ankle. So, yeah. so and, 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 and so the word says, can these bones live? Mm -hmm. Can these dry bones live? Well, they can live if we do what? We infuse. Mm -hmm the life of ideology, mm -hmm. of spirit into them. Mm -hmm. And then they have to be connected. But the connectivity, the wholeness of the body then is what functions. But that means you gotta collaborate. That means you gotta have principal unity. Mm -hmm. So what I say is, the notion I put forth is that we are about cultivating a culture, a culture of collaboration. Mm -hmm. when, you, when, you, when culture's in your bones, you don't have to think about it. 
to heal and empower black families that need to be healed, mm -hmm. black communities that need to be healed, and black nations that build. But that cultivation of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So we do these amazing gatherings. We just did yeah. a national emergency summit on gentrification. Mm -hmm. You know, we are working with a broad coalition of organizations to create something called the National African American Reparations Commission. You, you, you're talking about collaboration, and I don't want to come back to that because I definitely want to come back to, to gentrification. But also, we have a video where you talk about two black Americas. And when we talk about collaboration, let's take a look at that and come back. And so we have made, we have made, we've made some progress. But we're now in danger. Because there are now two black Americas. You know, 1980, 68, Charles, as you recall, the Kerner Commission report said there are two Americas, black, one black, one white, separate and unequal. That's when the rebellions took place. We were on fire. And we set America on fire. Rachel Rapp Brown said, you know, we need to take a match and light it to all of this, right? But today what we have is two black Americas. Not only is the contradiction of the 1% and, and white supremacy, even inside of our community, what we have now is those who have, have been successful on the back of the black freedom struggle. They're in the suburbs or the outer suburbs, and they're living better than perhaps they ever thought they would. Don't mean that you won't be profiled. Don't mean that somehow you won't be followed in the shopping center, but it's an inconvenience because you now got a nice ride, two-car garage, and you're living high on the hog, as Malcolm would say. High on the hog, as Malcolm would say. <laughs> Malcolm also said, you know, your oppressor will have you loving your enemy and hating yourself. That's right, absolutely. Yeah. And to that end, I'd like for you to speak to, to, to a dynamic that something, I saw something and it concerned me. If it was just an isolated mm -hmm. incident mm -hmm. and maybe one person or a small group behaved this way, you could dismiss it, but there were more, and that is, I saw some very religious black folks mm -hmm. want to jump on with all four feet Ilhan Omar, the Congress lady from Minnesota, when she was criticized for making comments that others thought were offensive. Now, there didn't seem to be ever a dispute about whether or not what she said was true, but it was offensive to some, but it was offensive to some. And there were, there were, there were black, there were a group of black, especially religious folks mm -hmm. that jumped on her. Obviously she's a Muslim. And so you have the dynamic of a division there of religion. Again, if we go back to Malcolm, you know, it's like no matter what religion we are, no matter what God we worship, right. you're catching hell because you're all black. Right. And speak to that. Dynamic. Well, first of all, we got to remember that, that uh, Congresswoman Omar is black. Yes, absolutely. She's African, right? Yes, she's that's what African, I'm saying. She's an African Muslim. Yeah. And my suspicion is that, you know, we see the hands of the orange man again. Because there are always these instances where you have the folks who say, what's the matter, boss? We sick? Mm -hmm. You know, who love the master more than the master loved themselves in hopes that some crumbs would accrue to them. Yeah. And so this is what you, you, you there are circles of people that Trump tries to call up, mm -hmm. you know, to do his dirty work, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. But let's be clear that we need to defend the sister out of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. She is she may stumble here a little bit and so forth and so on. That's beside the point. Mm -hmm. The point she's trying to make is that there's an imbalance in policy and there always has been, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that frankly, unless we solve the issue of Palestine, mm -hmm. the, 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 at, at least a two-state state, a mm -hmm. two-state solution, if we don't solve that, mm -hmm. then there are always going to be some people who hate this country. Yeah. And we're caught up in it because we're a part of this. Mm -hmm. Now, you also have some people who are evangelicals and so forth and so on. They have this whole mythology about, you know, the, the Israel and all this kind of stuff. And some of that plays into it as well. But in the real world where we live, mm -hmm. we got to figure out, you know, how to make the Palestinians whole. And that goes back to tracing that history. And really, they've made huge sacrifices. And, and one of the things is you get punished, too. Yeah. 
Because in reality, people don't, you don't see a whole lot of inquiries going to look into those camps to see how the Palestinians live. Mm -hmm. When you say you get punished, who gets punished oh, no, no, and by no. whom? You, you know, I mean, you have, you have sectors, and I'm using my language uh, deliberately, you have sectors mm -hmm. within the Jewish community mm -hmm. who will attack and accuse anyone who wants to talk about an equitable policy in the Middle East as being anti-Semitic. Yeah. Now, I say that because I'm a former executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. Mm -hmm. Now, the Center for Constitutional Rights has some, 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 some really radical Jews as, as in its leadership, not yeah. the least of which was Bill Kunstler, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Michael Ratner, mm -hmm. Arthur Conoy. Mm -hmm. They don't agree with that. Right. They, don't, they, they are, they are anti-Zionist Jews mm -hmm. who really are advocating for an equitable solution in the Middle East. And the, the cold reality is, United States has not is not a good broker, mm -hmm. and 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 President Bush is I mean uh, Trump well it's a little bit Tr President Trump is not a good broker I mean he's already moved the site so now if you are a Palestinian what are you supposed to feel right, right? right. so the sister's trying to raise that mm -hmm. and so we have mm -hmm. to stand firmly with her mm -hmm. and not let her be driven out and marginalized mm -hmm. and so forth mm -hmm. that ain't happening mm -hmm. we have to stand with her mm -hmm. okay. I, I, I really appreciate you dressing uh, that in that manner because, you know, there, there are those forces that because she dares challenge some status quo thought of powerful interests who want to annihilate her. They, it appears to me that there's an effort underfoot to do to her what this country has always done to powerful black men. Powerful black men who stand up with a voice for their people have always either been murdered or their character marginalized. has been assassinated character in an effort That's to right. marginalize them. That's right. Yeah. No. So no, I think you're absolutely on point about that. And again, it's uh, again, um, like I say, this is the era of women. Yeah. Right? I want to see these women in the forefront. Mm -hmm. You know, I have no. I mean, I uh, I am so proud of what we are seeing from black women everywhere, and to some degree women in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, for, I'm squarely for it, because it's been, it has been a male-dominated world. Chauvinism has, and patriarchy has dominated too long. It's mm -hmm. time for it to be shattered, mm -hmm. to create a new kind of world, yeah. right? Well, you know, and, and when you talk about that sort of patriarchal, you know, dominance, again, a manifestation and a, a, a serious, symptom of that is the person you call the orange man. <laughs> um, again, I go back to you and ask as a political scientist, to speak to what, has hap what is happening in this country right now where you have someone that was under investigation and you have a report <laughs> given and the report given delineates multiple, multiple offenses that could clearly be obstruction of, of justice and worse. And you have a, uh, an anointed, reviewed and picked attorney general who goes out, who's supposed to represent the people, but he clearly represents the country. And you have, for political expediency, a lack of courage in, in, in particular, one party. I'm talking about the Republican Party because to me, that is, you know. Oh, that's true. That, no, no, it, that's, it, it, no it becomes about it. obvious, you know, for us all to see. So what, you know, there is a sense of chaos and despair in this political climate. Speak to that, please. Well, there may be chaos, but not despair. Okay. But there are people who are fired up. People mm -hmm. are fired up. And, and, and necessarily so. Yeah. But the great tragedy is the, is the moral cowardice of the Republican Party. And we have to juxtapose, you're talking about white supremacy and, and, and institutional, we should just position this against President Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. If President Obama had done, I mean, this Trump is a serial liar, a serial offender of women, a serial anti-Semite, I mean, you just go on and on and on and on. If President Barack Obama had done one of those things, right. the Republican Party would have been leading the charge to run him out of office, and quite frankly, there would have been some Democrats who would not have had the spine to stand up 
to resist that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They so, went crazy when they wore tan suit in the Oval Office one day. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 but here's the thing that we have to keep our eyes on. Mm -hmm. What the evangelicals, these Christians have done, and the Republican Party have done, is they are focused on their agenda. Yes, yes. Right? Yes. And their agenda is to seize control, among other things, about something we didn't, many people didn't even look at in the last election. Oh, I don't like Hillary. I mean, she's mad. Well, you know, she got some issues now. I'm mm. not claiming that. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand something. The federal judiciary, including the Supreme Court of the United States, is beyond any presidential term. Mm -hmm. And in reality, what the federal judiciary does, it provides the sanction or, the, it, or it undermines either one policy. Mm -hmm. So after the period we just talked about, the post-Reconstruction period, what was Plessy versus Ferguson? Plessy versus Ferguson was the judicial capstone and sanction for Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. It took all of these years, up to 1954, to reverse that. Right. Now, what does that say? It can be reversed because yeah. social movements and yeah, client yeah. all mm -hmm. help to move that, right? Mm -hmm. What these folks are trying to, what they have done is they decided, and you look at labor rights, women's rights, uh, and um, uh, environmental rights, they're all kind of rights that get ruled on. Mm -hmm. There was a, by uh, the, the National Labor Relations Board, for example, mm -hmm. makes decisions about whether you can organize and so forth and so on. Yeah. That's not inconsequential in terms of people's real lives. Mm -hmm. Look at what they've done. Not beginning with this administration, it was with the last administration too. Mm -hmm. There was a quote in the New York Times said, they're with the Federalist Society, this quiet little think tank behind the scenes, mm -hmm. they have been prepping people a conveyor belt of right-wing justice to seize the federal judiciary. Mm -hmm. Because if they seize that, they don't care what happens with Trump. Mm -hmm. Trump, can, they, Trump is only a tool. To in seize this, the and, federal judiciary, and I would like for you to speak directly to the risk of that happening. It is happening. Not only, is, not only is this happening, but look how they're doing it. They, they're being very calculated. They're not putting old people on the, on the bench. Right. They're deliberately 50s. Some of the most recent people, some of whom are patently unqualified, mm -hmm. between 30 and 40 years old. Right. Some right. of them have even, haven't even tried a case. Right. Just imagine that 30-year-old person. That 30-year-old person, if they live a normal lifespan, is going to be on the court for 40 years. Yeah. That's 40 years of potential damage mm -hmm. that takes place. Mm -hmm. So if for no other reason, in the last election as a tactical, mature, and I'm not dismissing people who had a different point of view. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that when you look at the scene, Hillary didn't do this, do, 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 do. but when you look at the orange man and all that represented, mm -hmm. and you, you know, didn't like what that, but you said Hillary was worse and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. If you didn't do anything else but look at the Supreme Court and the judiciary, that was worth the vote right there, yeah. that one thing. Mm -hmm. But let me just go further. I wrote an article in which I said that Trump would be like Reagan on steroids. Because mm -hmm. what, what, what was he going to do? He was going to undermine the very agencies that, like the, 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 um, the um, uh, Consumer Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. That credit cards, yeah. the payday lent, all mm -hmm. that affects us. Mm -hmm. That affects people. Mm -hmm. They're destroying that stuff mm -hmm. because that's their agenda. Yeah. He, is, he, he is a fake populist mm -hmm. who's really playing on an agenda that rewards the rich and the super rich mm -hmm. and his own family mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. And these people are buying it. That's mm -hmm. that whole divide and strategy, divide and exploit thing again. And what makes it so bad is we're in an era, and this is an indictment on our educational system, so when I teach, I always tell my students, look at the other side. Yeah. You may challenge me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't get caught up in a situation where you're just following blindly anything. If you disagree, disagree with me. Yeah. Let's debate it. Mm -hmm. You got people sitting up there, if he say jump, how high? Mm -hmm. Or they'll say, oh, he says, he, like yeah. he said, I could go out there and shoot somebody yeah. on whatever yeah. and my support. And that is unfortunately what is happening. And that is a, so that's why we get, this is why strategically we've got to take the orange man out. So we've had two minutes left, unbelievably. Two minutes? Un unbelievably man, so. Well, you got to bring me back, brother. So, what yes, I do. Yes, I do. Much yes, yet, I do. Man. And I'm going to take that as a commitment for you to come <laughs> back. Um, so, Claude Anderson sat mm -hmm. here, brilliant scholar. Oh, yeah. It was concerned that black folks might be 
on their way to a permanent underclass. Right. Again, as a professor and a political scientist, what's the formula for that not to happen? And then tell folks how they can get in touch with you, because we only got a, now we got only a minute. Left. Yeah, okay, well, uh, the formula for, for dealing with that is, again, it's about organizing, right? Kwame Ture, one of our great organizers, said that people must be organized. We have to understand that this is not a spectator. Yeah. yeah. The great Gotta thing get in the game. No, the democracy is not voting. Mm -hmm. Voting is an important part of it. Social mm -hmm. movements are a part of that as well. Participation equals democracy. Mm -hmm. And so we have to get we have we, we have to retrain ourselves to become engaged. And engaging ourselves in the sense that we know what our ancestors did, what they suffered, and that we are on that we are on that path towards victory if we do what we need to do. Mm -hmm. So we need to be organizing our internal economy in order to mm -hmm. create more wealth and more jobs, mm -hmm. ind independent entrepreneurs and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But also, we need to also be challenging the system to produce more in terms of our resources. One mm -hmm. of the things that we're putting forth, Mark Mori and, and others, is the need for a Marshall Plan. Uh, uh, tell folks how they can get you in can touch get with in you, touch with that's an important us. element of what we're doing. That's right, ibw21.org, ibw21.org. You can live on the website we have for hours because yeah. we have such an Plus fabulous resources on the Institute of the Black Wealth 21st Century's website. And I want to come back and box with you some more, Man, brother. I'm going to give you a heavyweight championship. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Folks, that wraps us for this evening. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, go to WHUT.org. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye, and may God bless you. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.